have a core print product that's generating all the content we have. Obviously, we have a tremendous amount of video that's available to us um, through all of our networks, and we take advantage of that. We also have a relationship with ESPN the magazine, uh, but it's a, it's a twice monthly magazine. There's not a lot of content in general that comes out of there. So we have a big staff because we're creating it from scratch pretty much every day. Um, but extended beyond that, we have our production team, our design team, and our engineering team. And in the, in the uh, mobile space specifically, um, there's about 40 people that work on our mobile products. The vast majority of it is built in-house, and the vast majority of the work you see here is proprietary. Um, made a conscious decision to say, if we're going to own this relationship with fans, we need to build it ourselves. Now, again, not everybody has the luxury to do that. And it also doesn't mean we don't partner with other people, because we certainly do. Um, it may be this element of the iPad application we sourced out, or this, this process. Um, one of the things we're working on right now is a, uh, uh, an iPad application, iPhone iPad application, for scoring. So if you want to score a baseball game, um, and obviously there's the traditional way you do it, which is you get a scorebook and you, you know, mark the backward K when they, you know, struck out you know, looking. Um, that's time intensive. And oh, by the way, you just got pages and pages of this in a book. So one of the things that we think we can serve our audience for little league fans, for high school baseball fans, for even if you want to go sit at an MLB game, have it and do your own scoring on the iPad or the iPhone. It's one touch. You pick, the, you pick the out, you pick the position, you pick the batter. It's very easy to control. We're working with a third party that's done a really, really good app there that we think that we can possibly extend. And if you think about, uh, I'm not necessarily saying we're going here, but if you think about the opportunity of it, uh, again, going back to taking those high school scores, if I'm a coach um, at a high school baseball team and I don't have to call 15 newspapers and four radio stations with the results of my box score after every high school baseball game, but I can send them, you know, generate a, an, a spreadsheet or a, a data feed that comes right out of the iPhone that gets emailed or sent even more than that, maybe taken right into a production system. Not only is that saving time from the coach's point of view, and I chase down more than, more than one coach sitting in a bar at 10 or new, midnight on a Friday night trying to, hey, can you go to your car and get the scorebook? Because I didn't get the Green Lake High School score. Um, that saves time, but it also saves time on the production end if you're collecting that data. So uh, that's a case where we would work with, with a third-party app. We're always open to that, but we do put a lot of our own resources towards it. Yeah, Chuck. You're a veteran of uh, dealing with paid content. Hmm. First and foremost, I am a proponent of it. I always have been. We launched a, a product that I know, Jack, you know about, uh, I guess it was around 2000 um, in Milwaukee called Packer Insider. And it was a, pay, a premium content ded dedicated to coverage of the Green Bay Packers. Um, and the approach we took, I still think was the right approach. And it's an approach that I frankly, one of the, one of the things I came to, to do at ESPN when I first went out there was to oversee our insider product, which was struggling a little bit, this premium product. And I, I sort of brought the same approach to that that I had done with the Packer product, which is, I think, this is my personal opinion, I think it's a mistake to lock down all your content. Because two things happen when you do that. One, your limit ultimately limits your advertising audience because you're going to limit the number of views you get um, if you lock down your entire site. Um, and at the end of the day, advertising is still going to be a big part of this mix. It may be more f for some than others, but I think you have to have enough inventory to serve the advertisers. The other thing that happens, and you know, the New York Times found this when they had their Time Select product a couple years ago, if you locked, they locked down their columnists. And what happens when you lock down that content, especially high profile columnists, is it doesn't get in indexed by the search engines. So if you're searching, for a New York Times columnist on Google, guess what? That column's not going to show up because it's locked down. And I think we often underestimate, like them or love them, uh, the power that they have is either fair or foul. You can, you can make that decision. But Google, Bing, Yahoo drive a lot of traffic to all of our media sites. And being able to, to have access to that content and make that discoverable by your audience, um, I think is pretty important. I think the approach to the Times is talked about publicly. 
uh, doing next year is going to be interesting, where they're going to they're going to have a thresholding model. They're going to they're going to allow you to see certain number of pages um, free, and once you hit a certain threshold, you now have to become a premium subscriber under the theory that um, you're you're loyal. If you've seen that many pages, you're probably fairly loyal and want to come back and may be willing to pay. If you're just hitting a story once in a while off a search engine or for a link off a blog, eh, you're probably not that loyal and you're probably not going to pay. And if we just lock you down, you're not even going to see that content. Um, when, again, I'm sure you all have done this, but when we did registration um, on our newspaper site in Milwaukee, that's the approach we took. In certain sections of the site, you got to see five pages before you had to register. Certain sections, you got to see 25 pages before you had to register. We did it section by section based on usage. And I think it's an interesting approach. I think throttling the content that way could be interesting. And uh, I think a lot of people are going to pay attention to it. But again, in my corner of the world with Insider, and I'll talk about mobile in a second, but with Insider on ESPN.com, it's a very distinct subset of content. It is absolutely for a hardcore certain type of audience. Um, and if you don't want that content, you're not going to feel cheated on the rest of ESPN.com if you don't get it. And that's the approach we've taken, which is say there's a nice business over here for this type of content, but it's less than 10% of the total um, you know, story count that we put on our site in any given day. So good business, didn't lock the entire thing down. This space is interesting um, because the one-touch purchase is, is, frankly, a lot easier than any of us are doing on our websites other than Amazon. Um, and the ability to buy an application. You're not buying content to some degree. When you buy, when you buy Score Center XL from ESPN.com, you're not buying the content. You're buying the application that will be filled daily 24 seven with content thereafter. So it's a one-time purchase. There's other sites that are doing monthly fees um, as a result. I think this space will change the, the mindset slightly because I think, um, if we make it easier to purchase, people will be more willing to purchase than we think. Um, but I still think that the vast majority of, of the, again, for lack of a better word, commodity content um, that gets pushed out there has to be free or you will lose. I mean, you look at the sites that have locked down their entire content, and there are very few that I can say are very successful. Wall Street Journal has always been an example, but one of the reasons the Wall Street Journal has been as successful as they have in that space is because it's an investment. And you know, half of the half of the subscriptions to WSGA.com are are expensed through corporate accounts. It's not coming out of people's own back pockets. Um, and it doesn't mean it's not valuable. It's totally valuable. But the point is, whether I'm going to get my credit card out and buy it, I don't know. But I buy a lot of apps. I don't know about you guys. I buy a lot of apps because it's easy. It's just it's like it's like that uh, you know the the uh, the convenience purchase at the at the checkout line at the store. He's like, it's right there in front of you. What the heck? It's only a couple bucks. I'll do that. Um, I don't think we'll ever get to the point where there's going to be a lot of value in buying individual stories or pieces of video because I think it's too perishable. Um, I just don't, you know, people say, well, they'll pay 99 cents for a song on iTunes. Well, yeah, but I can listen to that song 10,000 times. I'm not going to read that same story probably more than once, maybe twice, or I may send it to a friend. Um, I think the collective content is what's valuable in that space. Um, so I'm, I'm a proponent of it. I think it's going to go there. But my personal point of view is I would, I would strongly discourage anyone that said, we're just going to put a wall around all of our content. Longer answer than you needed, but yeah. We are building for the droid. Um, 